Good morning and welcome to Coronado Bible Church Advent Online. If you're watching this video, it might just mean that you're not back in Panama yet. But it could also mean Sue and I didn't make it back into the country or that Panama is once again under Sunday quarantine. Whatever your reason for joining us, we're glad that you did, that you were able to tune in, and we hope that you'll be blessed this morning. Well, as you can tell from the environment of this video, Sue and I did make it back to Panama, and so far Sundays are not back in lockdown. So why are we not meeting in person? First of all, Sue and I enjoyed an awesome time with family back in the States. We got to be present for our niece's wedding. We met our nephew's wife for the first time. We ate a lot, we laughed a lot, we played a lot, we ate some more. It was a really good time. Well, we landed back in Panama on Thursday, turned on our phones and discovered that one of our family members had just tested positive for COVID. Now we had just received negative test results, which allowed us to fly, but we are still at risk and more importantly, we could become a risk. So we are in quarantine. As much as we were looking forward to being with you in person, sometimes prudence has to trump preference. Well, next Sunday, Lord willing, the service video, including carols and a message, will not only be online, but also shown in our facility. Sue and I won't be able to be there yet, but you can gather for some mutual encouragement. We'll be sending out the usual seat reservation email in the future. Because of how things unfolded, today's service will be abbreviated. But here's a special moment we had with Sue's parents to help prepare your hearts for the message. God bless. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, When I was a kid, the wait for Christmas started right around Thanksgiving. That was before anyone had heard of Black Friday. Back then, the harbinger of the holidays was the arrival of the huge J.C. Penney Special Edition toy catalog. Mom would give me and my brothers different colored pens and have us mark things we might like for Christmas. Not that it helped her much. Uh, often, every section except infants and Barbies was totally marked. And you need a duck blind for what? <laughs> and the way we anticipated Christmas morning. It was so difficult to wait. You know, there was a time when the wait for Christmas was measured not in months, but in years, in centuries. I'm talking about waiting for the first Christmas, the real Christmas. Here in the 21st century, it's difficult may be impossible for us to imagine how eagerly people of faith had waited for Messiah to come. Luke, in his gospel, cast the Christmas story on a stage full of people who are waiting. Mary and Joseph waiting for marriage. Shepherds waiting for mourning. Hannah and Simeon waiting in the temple to see with their own eyes the salvation of their people. Messiah's arrival the story of our faith opens in an arena of waiting. Well, 2,000 years later, I still live in that arena. 2020 has been a year of waiting for all of us, waiting for restrictions to lift, waiting to hear health reports about a friend who's fighting COVID, waiting to get back into Panama, waiting for Sundays together. But it's nothing new. In fact, my greatest struggles in life are faced while waiting. Waiting for God to act. Waiting for God to answer, to eliminate, illuminate dark passages in my life with the light of His purpose. And I know I'm not alone. Much of my almost 27 years as a pastor has been spent beside 
people who are in God's waiting room. A lonely woman longing for marriage. A husband waiting to see if his wife will carry through on her threat of divorce. A couple waiting for their marriage to just be tolerable. A bedridden 90-year-old waiting for God to take her home. A jobless father waiting for an opportunity to work. A wife longing for the day she doesn't have to. Young couples struggling to contain their desires as they wait for marriage. A man waiting on test results from the hospital. Parents waiting to hear from their estranged child. A man hungering for the day when his wife will be beside him in church. It's been in waiting with God's people that I've witnessed the deepest, most beautiful expressions of faith. Now, I've already kind of given it away, but if I were to ask you the most popular version of the Christmas story and where it's found in the Bible, what would you say? Would you guess Luke chapter 2? But Luke begins Messiah's story just five verses into his first chapter. We often skip this story in our rush to the manger. Luke begins his gospel not with the story of Mary and Joseph, but with another couple. It's their story I want to look at today because their story is saturated with lessons for those who wait. Today is about lessons for those who wait. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was a descendant of Aaron. And they were both well along in years. I missed one verse. Elizabeth was barren. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. So we have a priest and the daughter of a priest, but no children. What had the years of waiting meant for this couple? Luke doesn't spend any time here yet on that subject. He just sets up the problem and continues with the story. Verse 8 says, When Zechariah, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. There were 24 divisions of priests in all. Each division served only twice a year and then only for a week each time. There were limited numbers of sacred duties to be performed in the temple worship, but there were many, many priests. And so their duties were assigned through the drawing or casting of lots. It was kind of a priestly powerball. Well, early Jewish writings tell us that the incense offering was like the grand prize of the lottery. It was a great privilege to perform a function that took you into the sanctuary, the holy place, just outside of the Holy of Holies. A priest was allowed to perform this duty only once in his entire lifetime. Many priests were never chosen, but this time, the lot fell to Zechariah. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say this was the most important day of his life. Zechariah approached the great altar outside with a censer, and he collected some of the live coals that were always kept burning there. And the crowd of worshipers and priests parted as he headed for uh, the large steps taking him up towards the holy place between the two giant bronze pillars. He passed through heavy wooden doors into the dimly lit sanctuary alone. Zechariah proceeded solemnly forward, past the table holding the bread of presence, and onto the altar of incense. It stood directly in front of the massive curtain that separated the sanctuary from the most holy place. This was the closest the old priest would ever come to standing face to face with God. All of the worshipers outside were deep in prayer. 
On the small golden altar, Zechariah placed the live coals and then covered them with broken sticks of incense. Immediately, smoke filled the sanctuary and passed above the curtain into the Holy of Holies. It was supposed to be symbolic of the prayers of the people entering into God's throne room. Well, it was just at that moment that the messenger of the God, the messenger of the Lord appeared, standing just to the right of the altar. Now, Luke tells us nothing about the angel's appearance except by way of Zechariah's reaction. It says, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. It always makes me smile. These awesome heavenly beings appear out of nowhere into, uh, if, you think of the country, if you think of the Christmas story, they appear in the Judean countryside into a young woman's bedroom or a temple where a priest thinks that he is quite alone. And they always have the same opening line, do not be afraid. <laughs> what this angel had to say, though, was even more startling than his appearance. If you're following along in God's word, this is verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. What strange tidings these must have been to Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. How many years had it been since Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed for a son? I believe it had been a very long time. You can hear it in Zechariah's response. How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Luke doesn't tell us their ages, but they were old enough that the idea of a child was unnatural to Zechariah. Even though the birth announcement is hand-delivered by an angel, the news is beyond belief for this old priest. He doesn't even seem to take notice of the predicted greatness of this coming child. No, he's, he's stuck on the mundane. How could we have a child? The phrase he uses to describe his wife's age means to walk on, to go farther. Zachariah and Elizabeth were not just past the age of childbearing. This phrase lets us know they were beyond the average lifespan. They were well along in years. So we can sympathize with Zechariah's skepticism. But the angel did not. <laughs> At least it doesn't sound like it from his response. Verse 19. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Luke 1, 19 to 20. Think about, think about this story. God has heard a prayer that Zechariah had probably given up on praying. And now the angel tells him that the prayer will be answered at the proper time. Proper time. Now, if we were writing this story, the proper time would have been maybe 30 or 40 or even 50 years earlier when it would have been proper to have a baby. When parents could have been relatively sure they would see the child through to adulthood. But when we're waiting on God, we must be prepared for God to answer in God's time. I said this story is full of lessons for those who wait. Well, this is the first. God answers in God's time. And that's a problem. 
You know, I said I've seen some wonderful expressions of faith in waiting. I've also seen waiting turn to despair and despair to bitterness and bitterness to faithlessness. And I've seen faithlessness end in life-destroying sin. I have seen people walk away from everything they profess to believe rather than wait on God. You've got to believe more than the fact that God is on his own time schedule. I mean, that could be accepted as true, but in a very fatalistic way. Like, yeah, I know, God's going to do what God wants to do when he wants to do it. Forget about me. Somehow, you've got to get beyond that and believe that God's time is also the best time. I think stories like this one can help us gain that perspective. This wasn't just about Zachariah and Elizabeth. The birth of their son would impact much more than their personal happiness. It was part of God's great plan to save the world. A plan of which Paul wrote, when the time had fully come, or at exactly the right time, God sent his son born of a woman. Galatians 4.4 4 and Romans 5.6. The birth of John the Baptist was part of God's precision-timed invasion of the world. One of the reasons that our clock is so often striking a different hour than God's is because God is always doing more than we can imagine. God works in God's time because God is always doing more than we can imagine. That's the second point, the second lesson. God's timing is different because his plans are greater than ours. Zechariah and Elizabeth, probably their two most fervent prayers throughout their lives had been, send us a son and send Israel a savior. And God worked it out so that they got to see both of those prayers answered. Their son was the long-awaited prophet, the one who would prepare the way for Israel's Messiah, Israel's Savior. Go home and read chapters 1 and 2 of Luke. You'll see how God used timing, the timing of John's birth, to encourage Mary. You'll read how the circumstances of John's birth piqued the anticipation of his community. And they were asking, what is God about to do in Israel? You'll hear people prophesying, breaking 400 years of silence from God. In short, God was doing more than Zechariah and Elizabeth or anyone could have imagined or prayed for. Well, Zechariah encountered with Gabriel, left him speechless, (laughs) literally. Because of his doubt, Gabriel announced that Zechariah would be unable to speak until the time was fulfilled. That's at least a nine-month sentence of no speaking. But can you imagine the beginning of this? The old priest stumbles out into the courtyard. His eyes are blinded by the light. The worshipers are all there. He has the, the greatest news of his entire life. They're all waiting expectantly, wondering what had kept him for so long. And he opens his mouth, but nothing comes out. And so he did what probably any of us would have done. He started a round of charades. I don't know how it went. That's probably a bit overdone. But that's in the story. Luke tells us in verse 22 that the people realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Now, this extraordinary story takes a rather ordinary turn. Zacharias served out the remainder of his time at the temple. He returned home to Elizabeth. And Luke writes in verse 24, after this, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. Looking at the language, it's apparent that Luke wants us to know that John's birth came about by normal means. 
There's only one virgin birth recorded in the scriptures, and it wasn't John the Baptist. The great prophet John the Baptist came into the world because an old husband and an old wife made love. After all their waiting, when it became clear what God wanted to do, Zechariah and Elizabeth acted in faith. And in the normal course of life, God worked a miracle. That's important to know. God doesn't always work alone. That's lesson three. God doesn't always work alone. It's not that he can't. I mean, he made this twirling globe that we call home without any help from us. He could have made John out of one of the bronze pillars in the temple. That certainly would have made an impression, but he chose not to. He allowed Zachariah and Elizabeth to stretch their faith and have a personal part in the salvation story of their nation and the world. I really believe that sometimes we wait because we're ignoring God's clearly revealed will for our lives. Some of the greatest things I've seen God do in my own life have come about through small, seemingly insignificant acts of obedience. Little by little, God did something I could never imagine or have planned or asked for. And that brings me to one last lesson that I've learned from this story. This story has always touched me deeply because Sue and I know what it's like to be childless. But it must have been so much worse for Zachariah and Elizabeth. In all our years, no one has ever hinted that the reason that we don't have children is because God is displeased with us. In fact, many people have encouraged us, prayed for us, told us that they think we'd be good parents. One person even offered to to fund the portion of the first part of our adoption process. Some people even offered us their own children, although I'm not sure that was really so nice. (laughs) You know, it's far different. It was so far different for the couple in this story. Elizabeth opens just a little window through which we can glimpse the pain that she and probably her husband endured while waiting. When she found out that she was pregnant, Elizabeth exclaimed in verse 25, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Taken away my disgrace among the people. You know, when I was reading the first verses, I missed something because I was intentionally trying to skip over one sentence in Luke's introduction of this couple. Because I thought you could appreciate it better after hearing their story, after knowing the hardship they endured while waiting. This is Luke's full introduction back in verse 6. There was a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children. Now, this doesn't mean that Zechariah and Elizabeth were sinless, but these two served God faithfully. Their constant desire and bent was to please God in all that they did, everything, even in their waiting. God cares about the quality of your waiting. God cares how you wait. God cares how you wait. God took note of the fact that even in the face of heartache, disappointment, murmuring in the community, public disgrace, it didn't change Elizabeth and Zechariah and their commitment to him. They continued to faithfully serve and follow him. That's a lesson I need to learn. Perhaps that Perhaps that's a lesson you need to learn. Oh, I'm impressed when someone prays a prayer of great faith and gets an immediate and miraculous answer. That's what we all kind of hope for. But I'm also impressed, and in fact, far more often, I learn the deep lessons of faith when I watch how people wait. When you're waiting for a husband and you honor God with your time, When you have no children, but you befriend lonely people in the church or or take in uh, orphans. When you pray for your wife, even after she divorces you. 
when you keep your marriage vows, even when it's not tolerable, when you're bedridden, but you want Christ to find you praying when he comes, when you're jobless and serve the church with your extra time, when you don't shirk motherhood, even though you work, when you're waiting for marriage and you're more full of the Holy Spirit than hormones, when you get devastating results from the hospital and you still say, God is good. When you're faithful to God in the face of an interminable wait or a disappointing conclusion, that's when your witness is strongest. It's possible, no, I'm certain that God intends to receive glory, not just from how he answers, but also from how you wait. God cares about how you wait. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the lessons from Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. The lesson, first of all, that no matter what comes into life, it, it's possible to live a godly, uh, God-centered, obedient life. They, they pleased you with how they lived. They were faithful. They just kept doing the next right thing. They followed your word and your guidance. Even when things were very difficult, they, they kept going in faith and love for you. Father, you acted when they probably thought there was no hope. You acted in your time, but you were doing so much more than they had ever imagined, and you gave them so much more than they had ever asked for. And Father, you allowed them to take part in the miraculous, in the in the steps leading up to the coming of the Messiah into the world. What a privilege. Help us never to lose heart waiting. We're told in the Bible that if we don't give up, or not to give up, because we know at the proper time we'll receive our reward. Help us to believe that. And then, Father, help us to glorify you in how we wait. How we wait for this world's condition to get better, sometimes working to make it better, hopefully ourselves, but whether we have power or not to change the, the world, to be the best follower of Jesus Christ in it that we can be. Help the world to look at how we wait and be glor and, and to, to find you and, and to end up glorifying you because of how we live. We ask these things for the continuing glory, the ongoing proclamation of our great God and Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now, wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. God bless you.